The following is a lecture on CT intravenous contrast safety with emphasis on adverse event prevention and management. This lecture is one in a series of three lectures provided by the Indiana University Radiology Department. Additional lectures are available on the topics of MRI safety as well as MRI contrast safety. We will begin the discussion with a little bit of background on CT contrast. CT contrast can be divided as ionic or non-ionic. Ionic basically means that the compound will dissociate in solution. Non-ionic contrast is covalently bound, which means it will not dissociate in solution. We can also divide CT contrast based on osmolality. This is relative to blood osmolality. We divide them as high or low. The osmolality of blood is approximately 280 to 300 milliosms per kilogram. Ionic contrast agents typically have higher osmolality. Non-ionic agents are considered low osmolality, though their osmolality is still typically higher than blood. It's these non-ionic agents, which are also low osmolality, that have lower risk of adverse events, so they're typically the ones we use intravenously. We don't typically use ionic contrast intravenously anymore because they do have higher risk of adverse effect. Ionic contrast agents are typically still used today, just not intravenously. Common examples include high-pake diatriazoate, which has high osmolality, and it's the same chemical compound as used in gastrographin or urographin. Other common ionic contrast agents still used are isopake and hexabrix. Isopake has high osmolality. Hexabrix is an ionic agent that does have low osmolality. A key to remember which contrast agents are ionic versus which are non-ionic is that the ionic contrast agents all lend eight, which means they're salts or anions formed from dissolved salts. A few of the common non-ionic contrast agents, which are used intravenously, include iopamidol, iopromide, iodixanol, ioxalan, and iohexol. These non-ionic contrast agents all have low osmolality. Their osmolality is still higher than blood. If you'll remember, blood's osmolality is around 280 to 300 milliosms per kilogram. The only agent that does have an osmolality similar to blood is iodixanol, or visipake. In summary of what we've talked about, contrast agents are either ionic or non-ionic. Non-ionic agents typically have a lower osmolality and are typically associated with lower risk of adverse events. Injected intravenously. When we look at adverse events, we can look at acute adverse events and non-acute adverse events. Events that are not acute are hard to establish, as it's hard to establish cause and effect. When we look at patients prior to giving them intravenous contrast, we should risk stratify them to prevent possible adverse events. Overall, the rate of severe acute adverse event is about 0.04%, so it's not all that common. Patients at higher risk for adverse event from contrast administration include patients with atopy or allergies, patients with asthma, patients with anxiety, patients with renal insufficiency, and patients with cardiac disease. In general, patients with allergies of any kind are at greater risk of having an adverse event after IV contrast administration. The risk is about two to three times that above the general population. Patients that have had a prior allergic-like reaction to contrast itself have about a five times higher risk of having an allergic-like reaction in subsequent administrations. There's no particular allergy that appears to convey a greater risk except for contrast media. So there's no benefit in screening for patients to allergies like shellfish as has been previously taught. Patients with asthma may also have an increased risk of adverse event following contrast administration. Allergic-like reactions to contrast media are not well understood. As I previously stated, patients that have had a prior allergic-like reaction to contrast have about a five times greater risk of a subsequent event, but that risk is still quite low. It's thought that the reaction of contrast is directly on mast cells and basophils and results in direct histamine release. Therefore, it's not really a true allergy. True IgE-mediated reactions have never been identified. Allergic-like reactions are classified as mild, moderate, or severe by the ACR. This is a table taken from the ACR contrast media manual. Mild reactions are things like limited urticaria, cutaneous edema in a limited region, 
limited itchy or scratchy throat or nasal congestion. Notice they're all limited in their distribution. Moderate reactions are more diffuse, like diffuse urticaria, diffuse erythema, facial edema without dyspnea, or throat tightness. Severe allergic-like reactions to contrast media are often life-threatening. These include diffuse edema or facial swelling with dyspnea, diffuse erythema with hypotension, laryngeal edema or wheezing, bronchospasm, or even anaphylactic shock. Patients that are considered to be at higher risk for an allergic type adverse event to contrast media are often given pre-medication in an attempt to help prevent or decrease adverse events. Steroids are frequently given. The mechanism of action is decreasing circulating basophils and eosinophils and is greatest in approximately four hours. They do have risks also, especially in elderly population. While steroids can decrease mild or moderate reactions, there is no data that supports that they actually prevent life-threatening severe reactions. H1 blockers, such as Benadryl, also have a moderate benefit in decreasing the mild and moderate reactions, especially when they are given in conjunction with steroids. Managing allergic type adverse events is actually quite complicated and simple at the same time. If you look at the ACR, they have multiple tables with different scenarios of how they recommend that different allergic type adverse events be managed. But if you break it down, it mostly depends on the degree of reaction. Mild reactions, you can either observe or you can give Benadryl or both. Uh, moderate reactions, they recommend Benadryl plus or minus IV fluids plus or minus epinephrine intramuscular. And that's using a 1 to 1000 dilution and 0.3 milliliters or you can give it IV over a slow infusion of 1 to 3 milliliters of the 1 to 10,000. Severe is basically following your ACLS protocols plus epinephrine. So like I said, while there are different complicated scenarios, these are kind of the basic ways to approach the different reactions. It has been thought that anxiety is a risk factor for CT contrast administration and adverse event. And there have been studies investigating whether reassurance of the patients or education of patients prior to the exam might decrease this risk. However, there's no data that shows that there's any benefit from this approach. One of the frequent talked about risks or adverse events from contrast media is patients with renal insufficiency and the risk of contrast-induced nephropathy. Another less encountered topic is patients with cardiac disease. The major risk in these patients is that the volume injected in osmolality may offset their fluid balance, and those are different considerations that we need to make. Rapid decline in renal function within 48 hours following contrast administration is the definition of contrast-induced nephropathy. The mechanism for this is not well understood. The American Kidney Injury Network, or ACAN, defines this by a rise in creatinine greater than or equal to 0.3 milligrams per deciliter, increase in creatinine of greater than 50% from baseline, or urine output decrease to less than 0.5 milliliters per kilogram per hour for at least six hours. Patients at risk for developing contrast-induced nephropathy are any patients that have renal insufficiency or risk for renal insufficiency. Patients that the ACR recommends screening are patients that are greater than the age of 60, patients with a history of renal disease, this also includes patients with only one kidney, patients with hypertension requiring medical therapy, and patients with diabetes. A side note is that all these patients have increased risk for renal insufficiency, and therefore there are some people that argue that it's exacerbation of these underlying problems that causes quote-unquote contrast-induced nephropathy rather than the contrast itself, and there is some data to support this. The only approach to prevent the risk of contrast-induced nephropathy in patients with renal insufficiency that has proven benefit is hydration, and there's no data that supports normal saline over lactated ringers. They both appear to have similar benefit. Mucomist or N-acetylcysteine has not been shown clearly to have a benefit. Bicarbonate 
also has not been shown to have a clear benefit, as well as the use of diuretics, which have been used in the past. In fact, some diuretics have been shown to be more detrimental in the development of CIN. A final note on contrast-induced nephropathy is the fact that most uh, recommendations use creatinine as a cutoff rather than GFR. And while GFR is a better measurement of true renal function, most data looks at serum creatinine rather than GFR. And so because most data looks at this, this is sort of where the ACR and other institutions have put their cutoffs using creatinine rather than GFR. Here at our institution, we do use GFR as a cutoff rather than creatinine, but GFR cutoffs are different for various institutions. Now that we've covered the major adverse events from intravenous contrast administration, mainly being allergic type reaction and how to manage it, as well as contrast-induced nephropathy, we're going to talk about a few special situations or a few special adverse events. Extravasation is something that we often encounter. It happens about 0.1 to 1% of the time. Less than 1% of extravasation causes significant complication, and this is due to the fact that our contrast media is much better tolerated if it does extravasate than previously has been the issue. The major risk now is not actually necrosis of the tissue from the media itself, but it's more a risk of developing compartment syndrome. Like I said, this does not happen very often, so the ACR recommends, and most institutions do approach it this way, that you clinically follow these patients for a couple hours, and if the symptoms improve, then discharge is reasonable. Obviously, if these symptoms get worse, then transferring the patient to the ER or to inpatient or to see a surgeon may be a better approach. Children deserve special consideration when it comes to intravenous contrast administration. One of the things to consider with kids is that their intravascular volume is much smaller than adults and osmolality can have lots more significant effects than it does in adults. And so consideration of an isoosmolality agent, which would be Visipig, is warranted. Viscosity is also something we don't think about in adults, but patients that are smaller tend to have smaller IVs, and it can be difficult to inject contrast through these small IVs. Warming the contrast media can decrease its viscosity, facilitating easier injection. Another risk is extravasation. Also, given that they have smaller blood vessels, power injecting a child can cause extravasation more frequently than it does in adults, and so a slower injection rate of 1.5 cc per second is usually considered. What about pregnant patients? Well, we don't really know. It probably is safe to give intravenous contrast to pregnant patients. There is no data that shows that there's an increased risk of thyroid dysfunction or mutagenesis, things that you might be concerned about, but honestly, we don't definitely know the answer to this question. A frequent question from clinicians is in regards to patients on metformin and getting IV contrast, and this stems from the fact that there's a theoretical risk that giving intravenous contrast will decrease metformin excretion and therefore the patients at higher risk of developing lactic acidosis. This is strictly a theoretical risk, but given the fact that metformin is not usually a required daily medication, um, stopping it in some patients is a reasonable alternative to help prevent this theoretical risk. The ACR recommends that patients who are on metformin and have normal renal function continue metformin. They also state that patients on metformin with risk factors for renal insufficiency could hold metformin for 48 hours from the time of study. Keep in mind that patients who have diabetes are at increased risk for renal insufficiency, and it's usually patients who have diabetes who are those patients who are on metformin, except in rare circumstances. So most patients do fall into this category where you can stop their metformin for two hours after the time of study, and then they can restart it. The ACR recommends that patients who have diabetes and take metformin and have renal disease, um, that you hold their metformin until the renal function is demonstrated to be back to normal. Um, basically, they didn't develop contrast-induced nephropathy, which would also put them at higher risk for developing lactic acidosis.
So these patients, they do recommend that a blood test be established, you know, after the 48-hour period where contrast-induced nephropathy would develop to determine that they didn't develop it, and then if their renal function is stable and normal, that they resume it. I hope that you found this quick informational talk useful. If you have further desire to learn more on this topic, I direct you to the ACR manual on contrast media. I use version 9 2013 as my major reference when I developed this PowerPoint, and it's easily accessible to anyone that wants it at this website address listed here. Or you can just Google ACR manual contrast media, and you'll also find a quick link to the PDF. Thank you so much for your attention.